go it's a uh, time as well uh so uh hello and welcome to compass 2021 brought to you by caucus the discussion forum and the internal quality assurance cell of hindu college i am shabdita and i will be your host for the day uh, a year into the pandemic we have learned how to function within the four boundaries of our screens although it limited mobility and to some extent also functionality the pandemic was not without its silver linings especially for us students because it brought us a little closer to learning in continuation with the same efforts of increasing the cumulative knowledge wealth of the student community we present before you the second edition of compass for the information of the audience i would also like to add that this session is also being live streamed on our youtube page you can find us at caucus hindu college uh without further ado i would like to in invite our teacher in charge dr ravinandan singh to deliver the introductory remarks right uh thanks shabdita uh i welcome both the eminent speakers formally and uh, i would like to start uh, with an apology uh because uh, our principal professor anju sevasto because of a personal family emergency uh, couldn't make it today so i am uh, you know a shadow of representation of professor sevasto here uh, but nevertheless uh, very heartily very warmly i welcome both of our eminent honorable speakers uh they both don't need any introduction whatsoever uh, all of us are very familiar with their presence with their uh, words uh with their learnings uh but uh, as it always happens uh, before a talk it is good to be introduced uh, because it enables us in a short duration to place uh, the ideas and arguments uh, with with the background of the experience with which the speakers come so uh, just for that cause uh, we have prepared a very brief introduction which i will uh, you know uh, read out uh, starting with uh, ambassador chef shankar menon uh, he uh, we are very uh, greatly honored to have uh, mr menon with us uh, he is a prominent diplomat and author has served the national uh, as the national security advisor of india and uh, also as the foreign secretary of india he has been uh, the high commissioner and ambassador to various countries he has years of experience and expertise in diplomacy and international relations especially indo china relations which will be very useful uh, and insightful for our discussion today uh, ambassador nirupma menon uh, rao also uh, well known uh, for all of us to have an introduction uh, but again for the same reason uh, so as people become uh, familiar with the context of our talk uh, we introduce her uh, she has served as the former uh, foreign secretary uh, in the government of india and has been the spokesperson of the ministry of external affairs uh, she has a uh, recognized service and experience as the high commissioner in sri lanka and has been the ambassador to china and the united states uh her expertise uh would be equally uh, useful for us uh, for our talk today the theme as was outlined and as has been sent to all the attendees uh is on india and the eastern balance uh, of our talk today uh as caucus has uh, put it uh, the the dilemma over india's foreign policy has always been a major question in india's diplomacy the strategic position of india in relation to global powers like us and china or neighboring countries like pakistan has shaped india's alliances and policies deliberations over the aftermath of clashes in ladakh countering chinese aggression in the south asian region and keeping bilateral trade intact and the international position of india concerns us today uh it is that which we wish to discuss and we look forward to our speakers over to you uh thank you sir uh, we are indeed honored to have ambassador rao and ambassador menon here with us today for our next segment caucus members rito and kumar will deliver a short primer presentation for the convenience of our audience rito kumar over to you
Turn on your microphone, yes. Yeah. Sorry for the inconvenience. Good evening to one and all present here. Today, Ritu Bhadra Chakravarti and I, Kumar Harsh, are going to present a brief upon India and the Asian balance. The multi-pronged growth of the dragon has been accepted as a force to reckon with by all the major international actors. It has been con continually trying to emancipate its military bases in South China Sea to strengthen its foothold over the state. It considers South China Sea as a leading part to One Belt One Road initiative. Under OBOR, China has given vast amount of loans to numerous countries in Asia, Africa, Middle East, and parts of Europe. Prime of AC, it appears to be a global developmental initiative, but critics have argued that it has compelled countries involved in the belt to fall into a dead trap. India's position has been disturbed under these circumstances, and consequently, it has decided to tread with fine balance between maintaining its territorial sovereignty and presenting a strong stance against China. Moving forward, India has always adopted an amicable approach to its neighbor. Its relations with its immediate neighbor has been bitter, and the recent abrogation of the Article 370 has stoked the fire between India and Pakistan. China, too, has taken advantage of the situation by building a China-Pakistan economic corridor and virtually establishing Pakistan as its economic colony. India still has to solve the Bangladeshi infiltration problem while keeping China's influence at bay. A stable and democratic Myanmar has a stake in India as Myanmar's military is a stakeholder in Northeastern India's security. Under the current geopolitical scenario, India has been compelled to bury the hatchet and maintain cordial ties with less hostile neighbors, Nepal and Pakistan. Thus, the need of the hour for India is to maintain a policy of affirmative action. In response to growing Chinese military and trade clout and united by democracy, and a shared imperative to counter it, the Quad Alliance has been formed, which focuses on maritime security, supply chain resilience, and climate change, among others. Important to note is that India has opposed Asia's inclusion in the supply chain trilateral SCRI, reflecting the current priority being given to cementing the Quad, which besides moves like the Malabar exercise last year, has also decided to put in collective vaccination efforts. We all know that the Middle East has been the perennial pot of problems. While it is made up of a conglomeration of countries, what perhaps unifies them is deep reserves of oil. Though shifting to cleaner sources is the need of the hour, India simply can't ignore its reliance on oil, especially Iraq, given the fact that most of our oil is still imported. While a triadic trade bond shapes up between India, UAE, and Israel, Iran has been locked in a fierce tussle with the West but India has deep and enduring ties with it, as seen in developments like the continuing commitment to develop the Chabahar port. And China, too, is inching close with the signing of a comprehensive cooperation agreement with Iran last year. Russia has been our proverbial all-weather friend, but increasing proximity to USA has entailed a need to moder moderate and balance it. So even the US has grudgingly accepted developments like the S-400 defense deal. Concerns remain still with an assertive Turkey in Central Asia and its deepening bond with Pakistan. On that note, we would like to thank you. And that was all from our side. Uh, thank you, Ritu. Thank you, Kumar. Now on to the much awaited part of the session. I would now like to invite Aditya and Tanish to commence uh, the moderated discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aditya. Uh, Ambassador Menon, Ambassador Rao, welcome once again from Caucus Hindu College. We are elated to have you with us today and we are indeed honored to have one of the most brilliant panel that one can possibly set up when it comes to India's foreign policy and international relations. So we'll just introduce ourselves first. My name is Tanish Gedam and I'm a second year uh, student of political science from Hindu College, University of Delhi. Aditya? Uh, yeah. Good afternoon uh, to the dignitaries. Good afternoon also to the uh, faculty members, members of the society and the audience who have joined us. My name is Shanmukha Aditya and I'm a third year student of political science and history at Hindu College. It, in, it is indeed a pleasure to have uh, Ambassador Menon and Ambassador Rao here. And it's also the most opportune time to face this discussion, given the fact that recent developments in the Asian region and uh, many geopolitical developments that have taken place in the past few weeks have 
indeed uh, raised the importance of discussing this issue. Thank you so much, Aditya. So I'll be like uh, detailing out the structure of today's session. So firstly, we'll have a moderated discussion with both the panelists, which would be followed by a question answer session, which will consist of uh, a few questions that we have received from the registrants before the session. And after that, we'll pick up live questions from the audience. Uh, just a reminder to all the attendees today, the, uh, we, you are requested to put your questions in the live Q&A box and uh, they may start doing so as soon as the speakers begin with their talk. So that being said, uh, we'll conclude today's session by a vote of thanks by Dr. Ravi Nandan Singh. That being said, uh, Ambassador Menon, Ambassador Rao will start with the session. That is the moderated part of the session discussion. Uh, so my first question is for both Ambassador Rao and Ambassador Menon. As ardent observers and experts on the subject matter, uh, experts who have been at the most like critical decisions of India's foreign policy. How has the Asian geopolitical landscape evolved over time? And what does it mean for India? I request Ambassador Rao to first give her response to the question, post which we shall hear Ambassador Menon on the subject. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Tanishk and uh, Aditya, and uh, my thanks to all members of the caucus uh, for inviting me here today uh, to interact uh, with this uh, very interesting cross-section of the student community of Hindu College. Um, the topic of today's discussion, uh, India and the Asian balance, <laughs> is, I believe, a very appropriate and topical one we are confronted today, we live today in a situation which is fluid, which is constantly changing, transforming itself. And uh, India in many ways occupies a pivotal position in this scenario. And why do I say that? I say that because of India's geographical position, it's very central position in Asia, as you know, uh, the Indian Peninsula is one of the three peninsulas that juts southward in Asia. You have the Arabian Peninsula, you have the Indian Peninsula, and you have the Malay Peninsula. The Korean Peninsula is far east of us and it really doesn't jut into the Indian Ocean the way these three peninsulas do. And India, as you can well see from the map, occupies a very pivotal, very central position in this. We are both a continental power and we are also a country that has been endowed by nature to be a natural maritime power. It's another thing that uh, over the last 70 years, our focus and our orientation has been more to our land borders than to our sea, uh, surrounding seas, uh, the seas that surround our peninsula. But that is changing. You all have heard of the term the Indo-Pacific which has come into uh, parlance, uh, which has come into common usage, as it were, over the last four to five years. If we were having this discussion about a decade or a decade and a half ago, everybody would have been talking about the Asia Pacific and the Asia Pacific really being, you know, very oriented towards East Asia, towards China, Japan, the Koreas, and uh, to some extent, uh, the Southeast Asian nations, what we call ASEAN. But today everybody talks, and I think this is very right in terms of the geopolitical significance of the scenario we are confronted with today. We talk of a confluence of the two seas, the Indian and the Pacific Oceans. And uh, the term Indo-Pacific as it has come to be used really, I think marks the recognition that India and uh, India's interaction with countries in the region and India's place on the world stage as a leading power is important for the rest of the world and for, and for the countries that surround us. And what has this signified in terms of India's foreign policy and in the protection of India's security and economic interests? I think it has meant in many ways a redefinition, a realignment of interests uh, a change in uh, many of the ways we have defined our outward 
uh, links, our links with the rest of the world. For one, you have seen the transformation in our relations with the United States. The United States is very much a Pacific power, and you could call it an Indo-Pacific power because of its security reach, its military strength, and of course, uh, you know, the huge economic preponderance that it has on, on the world stage. And side by side, there is that dragon, or call it the elephant in the room, China. China, which is a neighbor of ours, with which we share a land border, which is uh, almost 3,500 kilometers, I would say even 4,000 kilometers, if you were to really take it from the Afghanistan-India uh, border, you know, right there near the Wakhan corridor up to the, uh, to the border with Myanmar, our border with Myanmar, it's almost, I would say, 4,000 kilometers. So China occupies a great proportion of the extent of that land border that we share with our neighbors uh, in the North. And um, in, in, uh, in that context, the relationship that we have with a risen China, with an increasingly powerful superpower China is, uh, you know, is front and center in terms of our security concerns and our geopolitical interests. And you all are aware of the complications that have arisen in our relationship with China over the last year, particularly. It's not that these complications were not inherent to the relationship. They were there to begin with. We have had a contested, unresolved border with China all these years. Uh, you are all aware of the conflict that arose between our two countries in 1962. In the period since then, there have been alternating periods of tension and uh, efforts to normalize that have gone on. A certain equilibrium had been established in this relationship from 1988 onwards particularly, and which had um, held for the last three decades or so. But slowly that has come uh, asunder, that has unraveled, and it's very clear that that model that template for the relationship with China can no longer hold, particularly after the tragedy in Galwan, where we lost the lives of 21 of our army personnel. So uh, that is, uh, you know, when I talk of the fluidity in the situation, this is one of the major contributors to, to that uncertainty and that, that, uh, that very, uh, very uh, complex element that has been introduced into the mix of our foreign relations and our relations with, with our neighbors particularly. But in the Indo-Pacific, uh, there are a number of countries, you had a presentation just now on the Quad, uh, India is very much a part of it and India is very less hesitant than before uh, to acknowledge uh, the role uh, of the Quad and the role that India itself plays in the Quad in terms of the military exercises that we conduct, our relations with fellow democracies like Japan, of course with Australia, and particularly, of course, the United States. The Chinese are none too happy about this, uh, given you know, all the size and the, and the uh, huge leaps of progress that uh, the Chinese have made over the last few decades. There is still a certain element of insecurity, perhaps an inability to really uh, you know, see their own uh, weight in the region as necessitating a corresponding reaction from countries such as ours. The Chinese have been uh, overtly dismissive of the Quad, but deep down inside, I think they are unhappy and they are concerned and they are, they are uh, uneasy about the emergence of this, of this body. The pandemic has uh, introduced a further uncertainty and complexity into the situation. Uh, we all know that. And uh, what we have seen, uh, and we had seen this even in the, in the period leading up to the pandemic, there was a certain weakening of the structure of multilateral cooperation, the role of multilateral organizations. I think in many senses, because uh, during the Trump administration years, uh, the United States had uh, taken a rather hostile approach uh, to many of these multilateral organizations. You saw the attitude to the World Health Organization, particularly the WTO and uh, many other such bodies. 
and in, in a sense occasioned by the growing competition, the adversarial relationship between the United States and China. As China rose, as China began to play a, a much greater role or in these multilateral bodies and, uh, and uh, a certain imbalance was introduced as a result of uh, the United States itself, I believe, looking inwards, its own problems uh, within the country, you know, You've seen the weakening many, in many ways of, of uh, uh, interact, political interaction within the United States. Just the, uh, the bipartisan element between the Democratic and the, uh, between the Democrats and the Republicans in uh, the United States and what happened after the elections, presidential elections, which really seemed to shake the very foundations of uh, the institutional apparatus that had been set up in the United States, uh, which was seen, uh, which all these years we had seen as the greatest democracy. I think questions began to arise about the strength of that democracy. And I think these are, these are issues that remain still to be addressed even after the Biden administration has come uh, to power. So uh, we live in this kind of environment today. When we talk of uh, balance in Asia, it's very difficult today to say in categorical, unequivocal and definitive terms that there is a, a, a stable balance in the region that surrounds us. Uh, you know, we ourselves, India, surrounded by the other seven South Asian, South Asian neighbors that we have, uh, particularly Pakistan, you know how complex and how fraught some of the relationships that we have with a few of our neighbors uh, is particularly with Pakistan, uh, which leads me to the question, I think, which I think, I believe we need to debate intensively. What is the uh, road uh, ahead for us? What are the solutions available for us to see how we can introduce a greater sense of balance and equilibrium in our region? I think that is for us to discuss. So I have just spoken at the end, not from a prepared text, and these are just thoughts that came to mind in a stream of consciousness, as it were. I'm sure that Ambassador Menon uh, will have very interesting uh, things to say on the subject. And I now leave the floor to him. Thank you. Well, I think uh, Ambassador Rao has really covered the ground. I think I'd, I'd just add maybe to what she said seems to me that Asian geopolitics is now entering a particularly dangerous phase for three big reasons. One is, you know, the balance of power in Asia has been shifting rapidly over the last few years. I mean, obviously, it's the rise of China, the rise of a, well, hyper-nationalist power, uh, who traditionally has looked at herself as the center of the world. Uh, but it's not only China. It's also other countries which have, I mean, Japan rose before China, India has been rising, Indonesia, South Korea, there's a whole host of Vietnam and so on. Uh, so it's a crowded neighborhood. And this is a neighborhood where in the last two decades, you've seen the world's greatest arms race, most of it in offensive weapons. If you look at the figures, it's, it puts battleships and dreadnoughts before World War I into the shade. Yeah. Today, there's a belt, continuous belt of weapons of mass destruction from the Mediterranean to the Pacific, from Israel to North Korea. And so this is a heavily armed and tense. And the other problem, of course, is that it is now the center of gravity of both the world economy and of world geopolitics. In, since 1980, if you look at it, uh, today, India and China together account for almost 26% of world GDP in PPP terms. That's about the same as the US. India and China account for half of Asia's GDP, by the way, which means Asia is getting close to being half the world economy again, going back to what we were back to 1750 or so roughly in historical terms. So. This is where the world economy is driven. In 2019, 30% of global growth came from China. Thanks to COVID, it's going to be even more now. Uh, so this is really the center of gravity. 
in every which way, which is why, but you see traditional power politics back, all the flashpoints from Senkaku's to South China Sea, Taiwan, uh, you look at our border with China, all these are in this region, which is not just the Asia, Indo-Pacific, because that's basically a maritime idea, but on the continent as well, where China is building the BRI, as you presented earlier. And therefore, now suddenly we, India, the subcontinent, South Asia, we become very important. We were a sideshow during the Cold War. The basic US-Soviet con contention was in Europe. Today, the basic fault line in international geopolitics is China-US. And that's right next to us. So we become important. Suddenly, the US is courting Nepal for the Indo free and open Indo-Pacific. China is courting Nepal for BRI and because of Tibet, because it's next to a restive province. Uh, and suddenly everybody is interested in Bangladesh. Uh, so South Asia has become important. India has become important because it's such a major part of South Asia and the subcontinent. So our location, our growing economic weight, the rise of China might have masked our rise, but the fact is that we do matter today. And if you look over the last 30 years, today, India, by any metric of power, has improved her position vis-a-vis -vis every other power on Earth except China. And that's why the basic understanding with China has broken down, asymmetry. In 1980, uh, in the Indian and Chinese economies were roughly the same size. We were at similar technological levels. Today, the Chinese economy is more than five ta four times bigger than the Indian economy. There's no question that in technological terms, they not only spend more, but they are much more advanced than we are. And they've accumulated material power, hard power. They are a global economic superpower. They might be a regional military power, but they're a global economic power. So today that balance, which had kept deterrence going, kept the border peaceful for about 30 years, that's gone. So what do we do in this situation? Frankly, we still have major jobs of transformation at home. We have too many hungry, sick, poor. We one third of our middle class has regressed thanks to COVID and the crash of 2020, has regressed back out of middle class status. So we have too much to do at home. We need a peaceful periphery. We need to find external balancers to deal with China until we build up our own strength and create our own deterrence and restore deterrence and build things back. So for me, therefore, these are the dangerous years before we can restore the equilibrium that Nirupama was talking about, which is so essential because we have huge jobs at home and we can't waste our effort on doing things externally, which we should actually be spending on improving the lives of our own people. I'll stop there and leave it to you. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, ma'am. Those were indeed insightful points. Uh, but I have a quick uh, question as a follow-up for Ambassador Rao. Ma'am, you talked about our current neighborhood, like the immediate neighborhood in your talk, in your speech. So, uh, the relationship and the rhetoric surrounding India and South Asia and like our immediate neighbors has been deeply politicized. So do you think this acts as a major deterrent to amicable relations between our immediate neighbors and how can we resolve this? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I think, uh, you know, I'm reminded of a phrase a Latin American friend used many years ago, referring to her own country, Colombia. Uh, she said the problem there was that they tended to politicize the everyday. And I think the problem with us in South Asia is, you know, India, in, instead of focusing on connectivity, greater integ integration, uh, you know, just getting on with building relationships that are pragmatic, that are, that are focused, you know, uh, Mr. Biden, President Biden speaks of a foreign policy for the middle class. I think for us in South Asia and for particularly India, we have to focus on a foreign policy that is good for the multitude. 
and the multitude in our country, as Ambassador Menon just mentioned, are, you know, it's, it's the unknown Indian. It's not you or me. It is the unknown multitude that, that lives outside our windows, that needs, you know, jobs, livelihoods, skills, training, education. And therefore, that's what I mean as a foreign policy for the multitude. We need more integration. You know, South Asia, as the foreign, late foreign minister of Sri Lanka, Lakshman Kadirgama, you know, he was assassinated about 16, 15, 16 years ago. He used to say that South Asia is an integer. It's meant to exist like that. It is really the subcontinent. South Asia is the, you know, what earlier we referred to as the in Indian subcontinent. No, I don't mean that in an expansionist or hegemonic way, but that really was the geographic term. Now, we have tended to politicize the everyday. I don't mean just us in India, but maybe we, uh, we have a big slice of the responsibility where that is concerned. So uh, look at our neighborhood. And I think when we uh, think of a, of a, a better, uh, better calibrated approach to the region, more equilibrium, better balance. I think we have to think in terms of, uh, of uh, necessities like integration and connectivity. And I, I realize, I fully concede the point that we have a very difficult neighbor, Pakistan. I often, when I, you know, I'm just by myself, I think, you know, what exists between India and Pakistan is really a, not a not uh, 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 an abnormal relationship between two countries, but you know, uh, different parts of, of, a, of a country that was once you know, united, and that has now been partitioned. And uh, we're, we're in a state of perpetual civil war, I think, civil war, brother against brother. I think that's the situation we, we are in. And uh, neither of us have been able to rise above you know, the uh, the smallness of, of things and look at the larger picture and uh, understand uh, the need for, for us to really get on with it, get on with a foreign policy for our multitudes. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, before I hand it over to Aditya for the next session, I would just like to remind all the viewers on Zoom as well as YouTube that please keep adding your questions to the live Q&A box as well as chat on YouTube so that we could then choose questions from them. Thank you so much. Aditya. Thank you, Danish. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Menon. Thank you, Ambassador Rao. Uh, before I proceed to ask my question, let me also remind the audience that uh, whoever is asking the question, please ensure that you direct the question to uh, either Ambassador Menon or Ambassador Rao or to both the panelists, please ensure that you mention this in this in your question, so that we uh, so that it assists us in directing the question. Uh, thank you very much. So, uh, Ambassador Minan and Ambassador Rao, building on your responses to Tanish's question, uh, I tend to focus on regions. I put I place a magnifying reg uh, place a magnifying glass over the region, and I tend to discuss uh, the shorter region problems and the uh, and how these areas tend to move in international politics so uh, ambassador menon uh, sorry ambassador rao made a very interesting point in her uh, opening remarks when she stated that uh, us cannot be disputed when it says that it is a part of the indo pacific and i also believe that ambassador menon would agree with that proposition when uh, it is regarded that united states is a natural part of the indo pacific uh, in order to ensure that Indo-Pacific is inclusive and the rise of China is contained, a few countries of the Indo-Pacific have formed this grouping called Quadrilateral Group, uh, Quad. And uh, a few strategic commentators in recent times, most importantly yesterday, uh, in the Indian Express, uh, Professor Raja Mohan written an article where he talked about where he talked about uh, building NATO as a counter to Quad, as in conjunction with Quad in order to ensure that the rise of China is contained. And the immediate question that uh, left me with the article was, can we actually engage with NATO and Quad in order to contain China? Can we actually uh, somehow, uh, but, uh, somehow divide our attention to both these regional groupings, uh, NATO on the one hand and Quad on the other to contain? Does it come at uh, a cost of neglecting Quad 
or does it come at the cost of uh, greater integration with european powers when our actual uh, attention needs to be on the neighborhood so uh, i'd like to uh, i'd like to request request ambassador minan to go first followed by ambassador rao thank you thank you thank you for that question uh i i think we need to be clear what we are talking about here a it's not neither or it's not either quad or nato or i mean the us is in nato the us is in quad uh she manages you know both relationships and what do we mean it's the purpose of the quad is not to contain china the purpose stated purpose of the quad is to increase security in this region in this maritime space it started as a security dialogue it then grew into various other things quad members now exercise do naval exercises do we have other security defense exchanges among ourselves we it's now become a much more open ended group it's now providing global public goods it now provides vaccines it it says it will provide vaccines for southeast asia we now work with korea with vietnam with indonesia depending on what when we look at resilient supply chains actually we've agreed to work with the others in southeast asia because you can't do indo pacific without asean that would leave a huge hole in the middle of the indo pacific uh so you need to work with other partners and quad will do that nato is a european alliance and the commitment is in article 5 that an attack on one is regarded as an attack on all that they will have collective self defense that doesn't apply to us a we're outside nato's theater b so there's no b we are not asking somebody else to join us in a military alliance for the defense of india and are we going to commit to defend estonia if she's invaded or ukraine or anybody any other nato member who might have their own quarrel with somebody else I don't see that happening. So I think we need to be clear what we're talking about with NATO and what we have actually been talking to NATO for the last 15 years. I'm not sure whether it came out in Rajamohan's article. We've actually had a steady dialogue with them. Because NATO has been in Afghanistan, so she's in the subcontinent, uh and we've talked we have very strong defense partnerships with some of the major NATO countries, whether it's the US, whether it's it's britain whether it's france all of them so we have had a regular dialogue with them both on the geopolitics on the situation on how we both see it but also on what they do in areas of concern to us we've worked with nato directly in counter piracy of the gulf of aden and the horn of africa since 2008 nato ships have been there under nato command our naval ships have been there and we've coordinated with them when it comes to convoying when it comes to patrolling so it's not as though we don't do this we've been doing this for a long time uh but i think we need to be clear even the quad is not your answer to china you have a continental problem with china you have the world's biggest boundary dispute and you saw what happened in the western sector last year you have a relationship with china which is basically in crisis now the entire lac is live and you need to find a new equilibrium quad is not going to solve your problem there that's a continental problem that's a problem that you will have to solve and you will have to deal with on the ground itself uh you know there's a lot of loose talk oh we'll blockade malacca you can't blockade malacca i mean 80% of the world's traded oil goes through malacca it's not it's not you can't blockade malacca to stop just to spite china because then you're spiting the whole world economy that that's not you can't use a nuclear weapon to kill a fly you know you need to have some sense of proportion of what you're doing so i think my problem with most of these big strategic arguments is that we're very unclear on the specifics and we need to be much more specific in the way we deal with these kinds of issues uh thank you ambassador minan ambassador rao uh well like your response It's hardly better what Ambassador Menon has has just said. I completely endorse his argument that it's you know uh, we cannot afford to be entrenched in these formulaic approaches. You know to what group, which group, and what group, and what alliance, and 
and uh, you know, are we in or are we out? I think uh, the time is fast for that. Uh, we have uh, problems, we have issues, we have uh, fundamental uh, questions to be answered when it comes to our region. How do we deal with the rise of China? How do we deal with our uh, fraught relationship on our land border with our largest neighbor, China? How do we better the balance and equilibrium in South Asia? These are all issues that go beyond formulas, that go beyond alliances. Uh, because India, I think, as she is uh, made out, as she is structured, uh, can never be part of an alliance. I think we're just, we, you know, look at us, look at our borders, look at the, uh, look at the um, uh, involvements that, that confront us. I don't think they are helped by alliances. They are helped perhaps by a closer alignment of interests with certain countries, you know, first and foremost, foremost with like-minded democracies, for instance. And there again, I think we should not start from the assumption and the premise that we are completely perfect. There are issues to be dealt with within our own borders. And I refer to the United States and problems with its own democracy. And uh, we are also uh, in an evolving situation uh, we are in many ways, there are many roads that we can take. Perhaps these choices are confronting us today and we will have to act wisely and with, uh, with, with perspicacity and with, with a sense of who we are, where we have come from and where we are headed. I think these are issues I think that we should be talking of and it doesn't matter, you know, NATO really has really no relevance uh, in, in terms of what India should be doing or where, where India should be headed. Uh, as Ambassador Menon said, we have a relationship with NATO. We have close ties with many NATO members. And just yesterday, there was news of how France has joined uh, other uh, navies, including India, for exercises in the Bay of Bengal. So countries like France, the UK, the UK has just uh, released its strategic review, a security review, uh, you know, post Brexit uh, a few weeks ago. There is talk of uh, a carrier ba battle group uh, headed by the uh, Queen Elizabeth II, their aircraft carrier coming to the region. Uh, but the UK itself, I don't believe has sorted out uh, what it is going to do post Brexit. Uh, there is a certain, uh, you know, empire hangover that it still sub, uh, is afflicted with, I would say. Uh, the UK is in a very different place from where it was 100 years ago. We would all agree with that. But I think uh, within their own uh, psyche and their own mindset, I think there are a lot of things they have to sort out in this connection. So um, India is not in a bad place when it comes to understanding and defining its interests in the region. And I think the steps that we have taken to come closer to the United States, uh, the very strong resilient relationship we have with Japan, I think we would all applaud that. Uh, we've come closer to, to the Australians uh, and we're you know, with ASEAN and it's so vital. We keep talking about the centrality of ASEAN to the Indo-Pacific. And I think in many ways, ASEAN uh, helps us also to understand ourselves better. Because uh, how is ASEAN dealing with uh, the complexities and the emergent situation in the region? There are a lot of lessons to be learned. Of course, uh, our problems uh, because of our continental preoccupations are uh, different from what ASEAN uh, is confronted with. But then ASEAN in many ways has uh, dealt with China over the years, economically, geopolitically, and um, more than, I don't believe it has really sat on the fence, but I think it has been guided by supreme self-interest when it comes to dealing with China. And I think ultimately that's what foreign policy boils down to, to act on the basis of your supreme self-interest. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Rao. I have a short follow up with Ambassador Minan, uh, if you permit, sir. Uh, when we talk about uh, a quad, uh, quad emerging as a unit of my greater multilateral cooperation, including climate change and vaccination among like-minded countries, uh, China initially dismissed uh, 
squad as foam in the water foam on the ocean uh, using that phrase and as squads meeting came nearer uh, it started it it somehow uh, i think narrowed down uh, dialed down its uh, rhetoric and called for a greater cooperation with india so that got me thinking as to why china would suddenly shift its stance and uh, from a greater amount of bellicose reaction to what quad is it somehow dialed down in its reaction is it that china fears us's presence in quad or is it that china only fear, china fears the coming of these multilateral uh, the coming of these like minded countries together which one does china feel afraid of no i think for china china certainly takes the quad seriously and the moment she tells you that it's foam on the water you know she takes it seriously because otherwise she wouldn't bother to use a phrase like that and tell you this and that that is clear why does she take it seriously because she sees this as these as serious powers on her periphery uh you know the us navy is 12 nautical miles off her coast in her face if you look at the first island chain just look at a map all the way from japan through the rukus okinawa rukus taiwan down to the philippines into frankly china has a contained maritime geography and she has the world's largest armada right out there uh she and she sees the near seas her near seas as dominated so far and that's why she's militarized the south china sea built islands built up this navy and this is critical for her future uh today china is dependent on the world she might be powerful but her power her economic prosperity depends on the world she depends on the world for energy for raw materials for markets for technology even semiconductors for instance so she is in this historically unprecedented position she's never been in this position before of being powerful but dependent on the world she's been powerful and isolated and a world unto herself often in the past during the high ching and so on but not now and so for her control of her lifelines as as hu jintao said once china has not only a malacca dilemma but a hormuz dilemma we in india talk of a hormuz dilemma but for them their lifeline is really under threat from other people and when she sees those people getting organized then obviously she worries and she, over the last 4 or 5 years the chinese leadership seems to have come to the conclusion that the us is determined to prevent the rise of china and that is not an unreasonable conclusion since it has been us policy declared since world war 2 to prevent the emergence of a peer competitor on the global stage first the soviet union in the 80s japan fixed by the paza agreements accords and now china and no hegemon hands over power happily or shares power happily i mean nobody does it in domestic politics why would they do it internationally so given that something like the quad will worry china so uh i think it's a combination of but what you're seeing now unfortunately and i think this is where the danger comes over the last 4 or 5 years china's growth has slowed down she's reverting to mean her economic growth so the performance legitimacy that the regime got from maintaining almost 10% growth for over 30 years uh that now relies increasingly on nationalism and you can see this much more strident not just wolf warrior diplomacy but if you look at the the narrative in the chinese media what is allowed on the internet what global times is pushing out it's a much stronger narrative and the trouble with that is you know okay let them say what they like maybe as long as they understand reality properly but the trouble is it also makes it hard for them to compromise to bargain to do the give and take that diplomacy negotiation that living with other people requires and suddenly things become non negotiable they become core interests for the first time in 2020 they started talking about all these lac differences as sovereignty issues not as a dispute you define it as a dispute by definition you have to give and take to settle it right you make mutual accommodations 
But you define it as sovereignty, then you can't give it away. Then it's territorial integrity is at stake. So it becomes non-negotiable and much harder to settle. And this is true of all these. China, South China Sea has become a core interest, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why I say it's a dangerous position. But the Chinese, therefore, today take offense at things that maybe 10 years ago they wouldn't have. And that's why they react to the Quad and they take it seriously. Thank you, Ambassador Mini. Over to you, Tanish. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Aditya. So uh, my next question is for uh, Ambassador uh, Rao and Ambassador Menon. Uh, both of, like, sir and ma'am mentioned about, uh, sir mentioned about his growing discontent with uh, the big strategic terms being used. And uh, even ma'am, like, slightly disapproved of the growing importance being given to alliance diplomacy. But these are the things that, like the eye-catching things in diplomacy and foreign policy are something that we as college students hold on to and grab on to. But we, you know, miss on to the finer details of diplomacy. For example, the importance of art, culture, and human-to-human -human relations or people-to-people -people rela relations. Something I think, uh, personally, I think that should be valued in this continent. So is... Can such things be an extended aspect or area of India's foreign policy? And how useful can such things prove in building amicable relations with our neighbors? Um, I request Ambassador Rao to first like present her views, followed by Ambassador Menon. Thank you. Um, well, when you uh, dwell on these aspects that you just spoke of, uh, let's take uh, communication as uh, some call it the lifeblood of, of diplomacy. And, um, and uh, a lot is made of India's soft power, for instance, the art, the culture, the civilizational heritage, and particularly in Asia, when, it, when you talk of, of uh, that aspect, uh, that uh, characteristic that is associated with India, I, it, I would certainly acknowledge the importance of, of it and uh, the necessity to leverage it uh, smartly because Smart diplomacy is, is very important, I think, when it comes uh, to the leveraging of, of whether it is hard power or soft power uh, that you possess. So, uh, yes, I would, I would answer your question by saying that uh, these aspects of diplomacy are extremely important. I think um, uh, strategic communication, you know, the ability to have that sense of place, of timing, uh, of... Um, of uh, timeliness of the messaging that you are able to convey. Uh, you can make a great deal of difference for the country and you can increase its weight if you are able to deploy these resources in, in a smart uh, fashion. So uh, therefore, you know, the importance of a smart diplomacy and uh, the stress being placed on matters like communication and uh, the importance of uh, cultural diplomacy. Uh, of course, uh, the business of diplomacy, as they say today, is business. So trade and economy and investment, the flow of technology. I think technology is extremely important for all of us in the world today. You know, we're on the cusp of this fourth industrial revolution, the whole issue of AI, robotics, uh, quantum, uh, communication, uh, look at the way the Chinese have burst upon the world scene in the last few years and become you know, leaders in, in telecommunication, for instance, and, uh, in, and, and uh, these, the targets that uh, their administration, that their leader Xi Jinping has set for the country in order to place China in the top league of countries when it comes to technology. So I think uh, these are matters that uh, we as a country uh, should also learn from. And in during the pandemic, so much has changed. Uh, the, the very contours of the world when it comes to how technology is deployed. Look at us sitting, all of us together today in various places connected through, uh, you know, through Zoom and, uh, entering this virtual space, but still being able to transact very real, uh, real world business. So uh, 
All this has now come into the purview of diplomacy. The whole concept, the whole definition of diplomacy uh, has changed as a result. I would agree, agree entirely with what Ambassador Rao just said. And I would only add that our strengths in culture, people to people, and our affinities, basically, they, we should really bring them to bear in the subcontinent. But we also have to be careful in the way we do it. When she said, be smart, uh, my, the example I like to use is Nepal, where every time an Indian says to a Nepali, Aap to bilkul hamare jaise hai, we mean it friendly. They see it as a threat to their identity. You've just swallowed them up. So we need to be smart, as Ambassador Rao said, in the way we use culture, in the way we, we might be very proud of our culture, but don't expect other people to be. And respect their identities, their culture, and work with it. But we do have tremendous affinities in the subcontinent. And we, those I think we should use. And it's very important, whether it's education, whether it's health, whether it's technology, there are so many other things that we should be doing together. We should be dealing with water issues. We should, you know, connecting our grids, our electricity grids. I mean, it's just the, the potential is enormous. And it can therefore make the politics and even the economics, which both of which are now at pretty hard, make those much easier to deal with. Uh, thank you so much, sir. And uh, that brings us, and thank you so much, ma'am, as well. That brings us to the end of the first part of today's session. And uh, I hope that Aditya and I were able to do justice to the stature of today's panelists. Uh, now we move on to the next part, that is the question answer session. And we have uh, some questions sent in by the registrants before the, before the like, webinar. So these questions are, the first question that we have is from Mr. Gautam Gunjan. And the question is for both uh, Ambassador Rao and Ambassador Menon. Uh, the question is as follows. Can India strategically take advantage of China's Malacca dilemma? Uh, Ambassador Rao, I request you to uh, address the question first, followed by Ambassador Menon. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think Ambassador Menon had uh, addressed, that, addressed that question. Uh, you know, when, uh, when we hear this kind of... Um, you know, all thought, as they say, is free and all talk is sometimes loose. Uh, you know, we talk about uh, taking advantage of China's uh, Malacca dilemma and uh, blockade, you know, talks of uh, blockade and talks of what would happen in the event of a war. What would happen in the event of a war, you know, one you know, cannot predict uh, all kinds of scenarios come to mind. But there are certain practical um, uh, issues uh, that uh, I think operate to India's advantage in the region. For instance, look at the Andaman Nicobar Island chain. You know, the Andamans are God's gift to India, literally. Just as, you know, our position in the Indian Ocean is geography's gift to us. Now, um, the Andamans are just, you know, a hair's breadth away from these uh, geographical locations that you're speaking of. And uh, to the extent that we can, you know, better strategize uh, what, you know, our, uh, our future uh, intentions are when it comes to how we strengthen our position in the Andamans. We already have a tri-service command there. Uh, the Andamans are, you know, so close to the coast of Thailand and to, and to, uh, and to Indonesia. Uh, so uh, perhaps we, uh, we have been a little too absorbed uh, for very valid reasons with our land borders and our continental preoccupations all these years. But today, when we talk of the Indo-Pacific, when we talk of the Quad, when we talk of military exercises, when we talk of better reconnaissance, intelligence, surveillance, uh, you know, control of the, this environment that, uh, that is you know, geography's gift to us, I think we should uh, see how we can better work with our friends and partners uh, to improve our position in the region. 
And, uh, you know, we keep talking about China is in Hambantota, you know, China is improving its position in Myanmar, uh, China is building Gwadar, or China has a logistics base in Djibouti. Uh, but let's look at ourselves and what natural advantages we have and how better we can strengthen our surveillance capacities, our underwater uh, you know, surveillance, for instance, uh, the reconnaissance that we are able to carry into the Indian Ocean and uh, across, you know, across these, uh, the Straits of Malacca, for instance, from the Andamans, uh, working with our partners and uh, all the time focusing on, you know, how we build our economic capacity uh, in terms of fulfilling that potential that the rest of the world invests in us and that uh, thinks of us with increasing confidence about. Mm, I, I agree entirely with what uh, Ambassador Rao said. I'd only add two things. One is uh, you might not be able in peacetime in normal times to sort of blockade Malacca, to do all these things that armchair strategists mention. You can use his fear of his Malacca dilemma, of his lifeline being choked. Uh, but don't forget, this is the wonderful part about strategy. He knows that you can't do it, and he knows that you're using his fear. So you know that he knows, and he knows that you know. You know, this is an endless cycle. How risk averse is he? Is he willing to live with this risk? He, does he see that risk increasing when you form a quad, for instance? then what you've just done is to raise the risk for him. His idea, his sense of threat goes up a little bit. You're not saying I'll, I'll go, it's not all or nothing. So this is a game that both sides play. How do you look at Hambantota, for instance? Is that something pointed at you or is it a ripe target for you? Should things go wrong terribly? You can look at it both ways. So. I think when we think of strategy, we need to open our minds a little bit. That's my only point here. And there's no black and white, true or false. This is a threat, nothing. Threats are also opportunities. Opportunities are also threats. I mean, we have to, Malacca, for instance, we must always calculate the broader effect on India of a blockage of Malacca and what the collapse of the world economy would do to us. And so it's a, it's a much more complicated, it's, it's like peeling an onion, you know, and there's layer after layer after layer, and it's fun, it's wonderful. But don't think that there is one answer or a correct answer, or this is not an engineering problem. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Menon, and thank you, Ambassador Rao, for that question. Uh, our second question is asked by Mr. Avnendra Yadav, and the question is as follows. The Indian Foreign Services has a consequential and a central role to play in achieving India's interests internationally. What are your views, ma'am and sir, on the IFS being understaffed? Uh, may I request Ambassador Rao to go first, followed by Ambassador Minam. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I must uh, you know, be honest and say that I am not privy really to the personnel policies that the Ministry of External Affairs, uh, uh, you know, has uh, on its, you know, planning board at the moment. But I can, I can only say that uh, this issue of understaffing or the lack of sufficient personnel in the Foreign Service has certainly occupied the minds of policy planners for more than a decade now. And over the last decade, I believe the strength of the Foreign Service has gone up but it's nowhere near that saturation level that would be ideal for us, especially when you compare it with uh, the diplomatic services of other you know, equivalently sized countries, take for instance, China or uh, even Brazil. And uh, so there is, there is definitely need for the numbers to, to go up. There is also the question of you know, how we strengthen the research and policy planning arm of the Foreign Service and how we're able to better integrate, you know, research personnel, uh, you know, the area experts, area studies experts, 
uh, language experts, you know, um, even things like speech writing. I think, uh, you know, you can certainly induct outside talent to supplement and to, and to strengthen the capacities within the ministry. So what it calls for is, a, is, is an open mind and a willingness to try these uh, solutions that perhaps do not essentially fit into the mold that you have been used to dealing with all these years. What it requires uh, to use a cliche is thinking out, out of the box. And I would only add to that that, you know, in 2008, the cabinet agreed to double the size of, size, the, okay. of the foreign, foreign office. Of, of the IFS A. Uh, and that was done. And as far as I can see, there is still an expansion going on, judging by the opening of new missions and the various things that the ministry is doing, but I'm not sure what exactly they're doing. But I do think there are other things that we can do which would increase efficiency. Uh, one thing that I remember, I always felt very, there is a very strong caste system within the government of India. There are something like 11 cadres in the Ministry of External Affairs. Uh, and when we go abroad, we all do every kind of job together, no matter which cadre we come from, whether, and, and that's, but when we come back to India, we fall into the normal government of India mode. And it seems to me that we need to open ourselves up internally because there isn't that much difference. Okay, you passed one exam at the age of 21, 22, but I, for me, you need to open up opportunities within the system, uh, at least. You need to change the way you work. There are things which MEA does, which we've done traditionally, uh, protocol hospitality. Now there's a whole Indian hospitality industry, which is world-class. Uh, we don't need to do those things ourselves. Uh, so there's a whole host of things involved in actually reforming the way we go about our diplomacy more than just the number of people. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Rao. Thank you, Ambassador Menon. We have one final uh, preset question, following which we'll be moving on to the live Q&A session. Uh, and this question is from Mr. Sayed Das Gupta. And the question reads as follows. How can India and Japan tackle the moves of China to grab a permanent seat in the UNSC? I think there is some... Uh, error in this question, uh, the moves of China, given that China is already a permanent member in the UNSC. So uh, I think there's some error in this question. We'll be uh, forfeiting this question and moving on to the live Q&A session, if that's all right. What it means is how can India and, China and Japan grab a permanent Perhaps, seat? yes, sir. Despite China, I think. Yes, sir. Probably that was the intention of the question, but the way it was framed was a little ironical. So we answer the question we like. Yes, sir. Sure. Sure, sir. Nirvaman, you want to? Uh, go ahead, Shankar. Why don't you? No, my, my views are not. <laughs> you know me. I, I always say, I oh. think this permanent seat is, is a beauty contest. You need 128 members of the General Assembly. You need all five of the permanent members. It's a popularity contest. You want to win it? Good luck to you. But as you can see, the multilateral system is less and less effective. You saw what it did with the pandemic. Being on the Security Council isn't what it was in the 50s and 60s. On the big issues of the day, peace and security, development and prosperity, the multilateral system is not delivering. So why are we chasing this? We should be chasing things that help our people, not a permanent seat on the Security Council. But that's my view. And I know I'm a minority here. No, I have also come around to that view over the years. I was once, you know, a believer in the need for India to secure a permanent seat. But more and more, as I've seen this whole multilateral universe uh, become, you know, shakier and shakier as events and you know, trends around us would indicate. Uh, I, I, and secondly, this whole question of expansion of the Security Council seems to just get more and more complicated. So it's, it's an, you know, an Alice in Wonderland situation now, I think. Will we ever really come out of this deep hole, I wonder? 
so uh, so i think it's it it uh, you know we have uh, we have finite energies and we must focus those energies really on getting our own house in order and uh, and strengthening ourselves and uh, and fulfilling the potential uh, that was meant to be india's and i don't believe uh, getting a seat on the security council uh, should be our top priority uh, thank you ma'am thank you sir so now we move on to the live q and a part of the session and the first qu question that we have is from rito brato chakraborty and uh, this question has been directed to ma'am so ma'am question reads as follows how will the indian government's treatment towards religious minorities affects its tie with the middle east and a reference is given to ayatollah khomeini's criticism of uh, the central government's handling of the delhi riots last year well the iranians always tend to uh, you know speak uh, in you know uh, differently let me say on these issues but let's focus on the gulf states and and that's where a lot of our key interests lie not only in terms of our uh, you know our energy security because iran has been in a bit of in a bit of the dog house ever since you know its problems with the trump administration uh, led to you know the sanctions issue resurfacing so so in a sense those ties have weakened in terms of our imports uh, from iran but uh, if you look at the the saudis and the united arab emirates and you know these are key countries for us and i believe that that uh, relations between the current indian government and those countries have only grown uh, from strength to strength in the last uh, few years so in that sense of course you are right that human rights organizations that ngos and uh, important voices also in particularly the western world have been speaking on the issue of you know treatment of minorities within india but in terms of whether these trends are actually influencing the attitude and the outlook of key partners of india towards india i think the jury is out uh, you know you may argue that the biden administration pays more attention to these issues than uh, the previous the trump administration that may be so but even when and if these issues are raised with our government i, I presume they very well could be but they tend to happen behind closed doors and you're not you're not seeing a megaphone approach a megaphone diplomacy uh, on uh, these uh, these questions these very sensitive questions thank you so much ma'am uh, aditya i uh, your question right uh, so this question is from preet sharma and it's directed to ambassador menon uh, the question reads as follows uh, china's rise as per rana mitter is based on acgt model which refers to a combination of authoritarianism consumerism global ambition and technology what should be india's long term strategy to deal with china's rise based on acgt model and how can india ensure its own rise on the world stage vis-a-vis -vis china well the simple answer is you can't be china and you shouldn't try to be china and don't imitate china uh, i think rana is right up to a certain extent but you know uh and when he draws on how the chinese have rewritten history and changed i think that article actually makes a lot of sense when you look back at how they've reinterpreted the republican era etc i am not so sure about the future whether it's an accurate predictor of what china will do in the future that's a matter of debate that i mean there are several versions but for india what should india do uh I think we need to concentrate on our strengths and we have a host of strengths. Uh if you look at our material capabilities both in military terms and economic terms we are much better off than we ever were before. But we need to engage much more meaningfully with our immediate neighborhood and by that I mean not only the subcontinent and the Indian Ocean region but Asia as a whole. you cannot run an active political military strategy if you are pulling out of the economics of it 
because for ASEAN, for instance, you can't walk out of RCP after eight years of negotiation. And you are the only major economy which is not part of any regional block or trading arrangement. You are part of SAFTA, but you know that's non-functional. It's not really working. Only 6% of our trade in South Asia is with each other. Uh, so you can't, you need an economic leg to stand on. That, but you've raised tariffs happily for the last four years. So you need to engage with Asia. You need to, you have done a lot on the political, on the defense, security, all that. You've worked with a whole host of countries all the way up to Japan, east of you. You now need to look west also, because for you, oil coming out of the Persian Gulf is critical to your future, your energy security. And the US is now an exporter. She, Fifth Fleet in Bahrain might still be there and will be there for some time, but her interest in stability in the Middle East and ensuring the flow of cheap oil out actually is gone, is no longer what it was. So you have to be ready for fundamental change to your West. So for me, you should use those strengths to strengthen yourself. You've seen US-China contention, that offers you a big opportunity. The US is interested in the rise of India. So the US will therefore contribute to the transformation of India. And we should use that opportunity and not just in defense, not just to strengthen your military, but to actually get your economy moving and get it forward. Uh, so there's a whole host of things, I think, in technology in other areas where you have strengths, you have opportunities, which I think that's what you should do. And there is an Indian way. We've always found an Indian way because as Nirupama said earlier, our interests are unique. Can you show me another country which is like us with our geography, our history, our resource endowment at our stage of development and yet with power and influence at the same time? I mean, that's quite a strange combination. Uh, and it's, certainly it's unique. So, and we need to leverage that, use it. Thank you, Ambassador Minam. Uh, over to Tanishka. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, even I do really hope that India finds the Indian way to leverage itself. Uh, and uh, like we by at that juncture, we come to the last question of today's session. The question is by uh, Savina Sharma. It reads as follows: What uh, and it is like directed to both Ambassador Menon and Ambassador Rao. It reads as uh, what has been the impact of artificial intelligence on diplomacy and engagement with allies? And is it realistic to assume that AI programs can reach the best outcomes for any conflict to make resolutions, for example, in Asia? Uh, Ambassador Rao followed by Ambassador Min. Well, I think the human quotient is still paramount when it comes to diplomacy and when it comes to solving the kind of problems that diplomacy uh, throws up or the absence of diplomacy throws up. Um, I think uh, technology and uh, all these new uh, scientific uh, accomplishments that uh, you, know, you refer to artificial intelligence or uh, quantum computing and uh, robotics, uh, I think in the realm of security, in the realm of uh, you know, non-conventional forms of warfare, for instance, in, the, in terms of uh, you know, safeguarding uh, you know, internal security, uh, they, these are tools often used controversially uh, for surveillance of citizenry in countries today. Look what is happening in China. I really don't know if... Uh, you can extend these definitions uh, to uh, the sphere of diplomacy because diplomacy really, I think, is what happens between humans. And uh, when you see the real life problems that you encounter, it's not, not issues of how you make your life more comfortable or, or uh, more efficiently organized or you know, real life issues of war and peace, I think really need people, uh, countries to sit down, negotiate, 
Now, I cannot think of uh, Sophia, the robot, really negotiating, uh, negotiating a, a solution uh, to the Kashmir problem, for instance. It is something that India and Pakistan need uh, uh, to, to sit down, not Indian and Pakistani robots, but Indian and Pakistani homo sapiens, as it were. We have to, we have to sit down and talk about these, these questions. So, but at the same time, as I said, you know, the whole issue of technology and how we can make lives better with technology and make it more efficient with technology is something that should occupy diplomacy because it's what we as diplomats uh, stationed in countries to further our own national interest should be concerned with, should keep abreast. Ma'am, uh, ma we can't hear you. It says the host mu muted us. Uh, okay, all right. Jivesh, please take care of that. Should not Can happen. Uh, when did you talk um, here? After Homo sapiens. Okay. So I said, you know, these are issues that, that uh, where diplomacy is concerned, I think the home and human quotient, quotient is very, very important. But I'm not trying to detract from the importance of technology as a sphere of concern, of interest, of activity that should occupy diplomats, we as diplomats, because, you know, technology is really what makes the world go round today. And um, for India, co collaboration in technology, take the Quad for instance, if you're talking of an alternative to 5G, uh, when you're talking of democracies coming together to see how we can devise solutions that safeguard our interest against, you know, what China is doing and the real concerns that arise from the intrusiveness of China manufactured technology in our lives. All this is are matters that are the lifeblood of diplomacy today. So I'm not saying that diplomacy should be divorced from artificial intelligence or from these new technologies, uh, uh, but that one should keep in mind that human intelligence uh, being deployed in a manner that furthers our interests in all these areas should be, uh, should should always remain in focus. I, I agree with Nirupama that diplomacy is a people business. And ultimately you need to look into somebody's eyes to be A, to judge their intent, B, to actually adjust your interests and decide whether or not, yes, this is all you're going to get out of this. And is this enough or not? That's a human decision. Uh, you can't write an, a formula to tell you that. Uh, but what impact will AI have on diplomacy? Like all previous big technological changes, it will change the way in which we work. But human beings are still central to the work itself. Uh, whether it was the telegraph, telephone, you know, at each stage they said, now diplomacy is over. You don't need it anymore. Heads of state can talk to each other. Uh, but uh, you still need diplomacy. And it's still, in fact, you need it much more. And there's much more work for diplomats. And ultimately, AI is just one more new technology, which promises a revolution. Uh, we'll do the same things, human beings, every new technology. What have we done? We've made money, we've made war, and we've used them for surveillance and espionage and to spy on other people. Uh, and we'll do it again with AI. Our fear with AI is that we lose control of AI, that it's going to actually... Sorry, I'm trying to switch this off. So the problem is really that. So the problem is really that, uh, no matter what you do, you can't. I don't know why this goes on. Uh, no matter what you do, your fear is that AI will take over your life, that you lose control of the technology. You've had that fear of every technology that came before. When bombers first came, you got, you got so nervous. And every time you say, now let's control the technology, and it never works. You've tried to set up an international regime for each technology as it came, and each time it doesn't work. And the technology is then used by people, as I said, to make money, make war, and to spy on each other. And we will, I'm sure, do the same with AI. 
but it'll change the way that we work. But I don't, I think, frankly, if anybody's interested in diplomacy, there is lifetime employment ahead. Don't worry. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, for many of us who are aspirants in diplomacy, I think that is uh, a positive note to end today's discussion on. Uh, Ambassador Rao, Ambassador Menon, it has indeed been a brilliant conversation, thoroughly engaging. And most of us, I think, who are interested in diplomacy have a renewed interest. And those who were somehow fatigued with all the China headlines from the past year surely have something to look forward right now. Uh, that brings us to like the end of our roles in today's webinar. I now hand over uh, the session to Shabdita to conclude it. Thank you, Ambassador Rao, and thank you, Ambassador Menon. That was indeed an extremely informative and enlightening session. And I'm absolutely certain that all of us here have learned greatly from your insights into diplomacy today. So that brings us to the end of our inaugural session for Compass 2021. Uh, I would request Ravi sir to deliver the vote of thanks. Right. Thank you, Shabdita. Yes, I echo uh, your, uh, you know, verdict and uh, Tanek's uh, verdict. Uh, this was a great experience. I uh, personally learned a lot coming from sociology. Uh, question of balance is our staple, uh, you know, uh, so it's good to start with balance and end with balance, which is what, uh, you know, both of our eminent speakers did and this was just uh, pure wonder and uh, just to be on the other side of newspapers and uh, uh, to be on the other side of headlines and to hear from people who are insiders uh, is so uh, facilitative even cathartic you know you you get to hear uh, things that you always wonder when you're reading or hearing news and you just wonder if somebody could sort of say a bit more on this. Uh, so we, we were so lucky to have this. Uh, and uh, once again, I want to, uh, you know, extend my deep thankfulness on behalf of the college uh, principal's office, uh, who has been absent today, uh, very unlike uh, her because of the personal emergency, as I said. Uh, but once again, I sincerely thank both our speakers uh, and uh, I uh, thank uh, the convener of IQAC to have coordinated this. And of course, uh, to all of you uh, caucus members and the audiences who joined today. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. For the knowledge of our audience, a transcript of this conversation will be available on our website. You can find us at www.caucushindu.in. So that is all from our side for today. Join us again on April 12th, where we are in conversation with eminent lawyer, Ms. Indra Jessing. That's it from our side. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you soon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, Shankar. Thank you. Thanks, Nirupama. See you. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Jivesh and Dominic.